He teaches at the University of Cambridge as a diploma student master and as director of uh, postgraduate studies. Uh, the title of his keynote lecture is The Community Community Latent World of Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dan Borges. I think the computer is even connected. Himself, actually, he has it from his older contemporary, 
in Vienna, uh, Avenarius. And um, Avenarius wrote a book uh, before Husserl called Der Menschliche Weltbegriff, which means human concept of world. Husserl acknowledged that his interpretation, well, Husserl acknowledged that his interpretation is not the last one. This is clearly expressed by the description of the attitude and interpretation of world as he gives it himself. Called Husserl, world, he says about the world, um, we always live in the world or lived world. Normally there is no reason for making it explicitly semantic. And conscious of the world as a horizon, we live for our particular ends, whether as momentary or changing ones, or as enduring goal that guides us. And on a different place, again, so, this manner of clarifying the history of the world by inquiring back into the primal establishment of the goals which bind together the chain of future generations, insofar as the goals live on sedimented forms, yet can be reawakened again, and again, and in the new vitality can be criticized. The response and party criticism of Husserl, very important one, same time, of course, it has to be seen as a radically new understanding of world that represents a new epoch in modern thinking, was formulated by, as we know, Heidegger. We are familiar with his break from Husserl's transcendental subjectivism. The interpretation of the world in terms of four regions very well known in German Gefeert, or for in English, God, mortals, heaven, and heirs. Now he's using it, as we know, in, as a scheme for the understanding of the work of art and the nature of things. It's interesting that in his later writings, Heidegger articulates the problem of being itself as the main theme of his philosophy. Fair enough, we know that. Really, it does. It's Heidegger. But he also refers later on to being as being already structured in a way that represents or includes the four regions, quadra, which means again, the God, mortals, heaven, and earth, which as he understands, constitute the world and are gathered at the point of this intersection of the crossover being. He does being with capital B crosses out. Now the intersection of the cross is a place of arrivals. The togetherness, in other words, of man seen as Dasein, being there, and world, where the fourfold, the four regions of the world, to which being, as he is in that admits, has always remained a provisional name. Now it's interesting that you know this particular image shows very clearly that configuration is one of the possible ones are many, 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 but this is a very good one. It's an illustration from um, Fouquet, French man, 16th century, like 15th century. <coughs> and um, it illustrates very nicely the vertical relation between the heaven and earth and the mortals and the potential presence of the divine in the sky. What is interesting, of course, that when it comes down to earth, the mortals are not standing, just are kneeling on the earth, are as were embedded in earth. So there is a clear, strong moment of corporeality and embodiment. It is rather critical that for Heidegger, the mode of being of man, and by implication of wealth, does not have much of a body of corporeality. That's really the limit, in a way, in my and then um, shortcoming to some extent of the two self, sorry, Heidegger understanding of that. Uh, now, in other words, the missing is the embodied, are the phenomena as fully embodied. He in fact says in his being and time, quote, Heidegger, the bodily nature hides a whole problematic of its own, though we shall not treat it here. End of sentence. As we know, he never returned to it in any consistent way. It's interesting that later Gadamer, who is very close to side of him, close to Heidegger, confirms, quote Gadamer now, the philosophical tradition to which I too belong as a phenomenologist and student of Husserl and Heidegger, 
has done little to illuminate the theme of the body and embodiment and its particular obscurity. It is no accident that Heidegger himself was forced to admit that he had not reflected on the theme of the body or concentrated his intellectual power on it to the same extent that he had on so many other essential themes of human existence. I don't think Gallagher would. In his later years, Gallagher returned to the theme of embodiment, but the results of the thinking, though interesting, remains rather fragmentary as far as the overall nature of wealth is concerned. As late as 1986, when he was 86 years old, he writes, quote, the phrase the body and embodiment, like the living body and life, sounds almost like a play on words, and just and thus acquires for us an almost mysterious presence. It vividly presents absolute inseparability of the living body and life itself. We should perhaps even ask ourselves whether questions of concerning the existence of the soul, indeed, any talk of the soul, at all, would ever arise if we did not experience the body both as something living and as something subject to the care. Um, it's interesting, just very little comment in one of the conversations that I, mean, I had asked him very explicitly about the problem, particularly in relation to Melo Ponti, who, as you know, was one of the first who made quite effort to introduce the notion of embodiment into this way of thinking. Garamel replied was, oh yes, oh yes, I know about it. But the book was published in 1946, just after the war. We Germans had no access to French books. When the books were available, it's quite clear, the embodiment, the Germans just simply did not somehow like very much. It was difficult to incorporate in the system of thinking that was established you know, back to himself and so on. So the body was there, but was seen from the point of view of human language or from the point of consciousness, not really from the point of view of the body itself. And that's exactly the point that we trying to look at more closely as we go. <coughs> Um, that the verb was traditionally structured in reference to corporeal is well illustrated by the long tradition of the link, or perhaps reciprocity, or what we know as microcosm and macrocosm. And um, that was seen as manifestation or as example of reality as a whole. This was encapsulated during the Middle Ages in particular in a phrase. Mundus minor exemplum est maiores mundi ordine. So man is the manifestation, revelation of the order, of the overall order of things. Now in his contemporary, uh, sorry, in his commentary, in Plato Timenius, one of the medieval translation commentary, comment, uh, commentator on Plato, Calcidius speaks summarily about man as mundus brevem, man as abbreviation of cosmos, the whole reality. Man as the abbreviation of the world in our case. It is true that the theme of corporeality and embodiment was included in the studies of anthropology during the 20th century in the touch or sometimes outside the influence of phenomenology in philosophical anthropology in general, particularly to be people like Galen, Plessner, in psychiatry, certainly people like Goldstein, Binswanger, and in philosophy, mostly the French, Gabriel Marcel, Merleau Ponty, certainly, and Levinas later. Not to mention just the obvious examples, you can mention many more. But none of them, including Merleau Ponty, whose contribution to the understanding of corporeality is particularly unique and profound, did create a coherent new understanding of that. The exception is recently discovered and so far, I mean, recently discovered outside in a broader world, as it were, the culture in the West, particularly. Um, a less known philosopher, Jan Patochka, who devoted to the problem of embodiment most of his later life. He studied with Husserl, Heidegger, very close collaborator of Fink and Van Grebe, assistants of Husserl, and very close to Garamer. He published already in 1937. 
first opus magnum with the title Natural Verb, or Phenomenology as Natural Verb. And his interpretation of the world is based on what he describes as the ontological movement of human existence. In his own words, quote, the goal here is rather to grasp a more original sense in which we are creatures of the world. This will be still for the microcosm. Um, creatures of the world to capture in our description that sense in which our life still bears the trace within it and out of which we have been individuated. And thus, to bring to ourselves a more radical concept of the world and of design, more radical than that of Heidegger. End of quote. As a first important step, the Heideggerian notion of thrownness, to be thrown in the world, and being eventually as a result in the world, Patochka replaced that by being of the world. <coughs> Humans, in Patochka understanding, and are integrated into the world already by virtue of their corporeality. Precisely corporeity, he says, is what places humans into the world as, instinct, sorry, as intrinsically living beings, living alive. To live alive depends not only on our corporeity, but also on our spatiality, being in space, spatial, which allows us to move around. In a deeper sense, all three, corporeality, spatiality, and movement, we all together, as the main characteristic of human security, that's really the step to be taken now to the world beyond the Heideggerian understanding of being as well. We are situated more deeply in terms of our corporeal involvement. Now, what is meant by human situation? Question mark. Situation is a place where our world manifests itself. We don't experience the world directly as it were, only conceptually. The world as a whole, we can only come to terms with through where we are and within the reach of that territory that is available to us in direct experience. And that I discover as a situation being situated in that particular situation in which the world manifests itself in the most direct way. Situation is a place where our world therefore manifests itself, comes to visibility and presence. In the same way as language, world comes to presence actuality, right? Only where we ourselves are situated. We can ask the same question about the world as we can about language. There is language, there is other music. It's there, but not available. Only comes to visibility when we use it. Answer. It is available, but only potentially. In the sphere of our Latin world. That's the term I'm using for that particular phenomenon. Without manifest itself in situations, but the world is potentially present beyond the situation. And that situation helps us to reveal it and make it available to us and grasp it. Human situations, fascinating issue which is for us as architects, represents the most complete way of understanding the condition and nature of our experience of the surrounding world and the human qualities of the world. Situations and our experience with durability in relation to which other experiences can acquire meaning and can form a memory and eventually history. The temporal dimension makes the process of differentiation and stabilization of situation more comprehensible. The deeper we move into the history of situations, I mean typical situation or paradigmatic if you like, sometimes the term, uh, ceremonial meal, listening to music, conversation, any kind of institution you want to think of are situated and have a history. The more you move deep into history, the more situations share the common precedence until they reach the level of poetry and myth, which are the ultimate comprehensible foundation. Myth, as well as poetry, and also narratives, creation stories, legends, and the dimensions of culture which open the way to a unity of our experience and the unity of our world. In their essence, myth and poetry 
are an interpretation of primary symbols, which are spontaneously formed and which preserve the memory of our first encounters with the condition which can be described as cosmic or natural conditions of our own existence. Encounter with mountains, trees, and waters, and stones, and so on and so forth. They create the primary level of symbolism out of which narratives translate it further into secondary symbolism. The persistence of primary symbols, particularly in the field of architecture, contributes decisively to the formation of secondary symbols and finally to the formation of typical or paradigmatic situations. This is their involvement in the Vienna And now paradise is a one typical example of that primordial situation. Um, the nature of paradigmatic situation is similar to nature of institutions, deep structures, or archetypes. If you look closely at a concrete example, say for instance the French Cafe, for instance, you have to us a place where in modern times our world was and probably still is articulated and shared most explicitly in a way that it was in the past, before modern times, uh, formed in religious centers, in theaters, in fraternities, etc., etc. This is our modern equivalent of it. It's obvious that the essential nature of this kind of meeting place is only partly revealed in its visible appearance. For the most part, it is hidden in the field of references to the social, cultural life, related to the place, and so on. We have to remember that that's where political conversation would have time, taken place, literature, art, philosophy, etc. Paris, Café Procop, but the encyclopedists formulated the first version of the encyclopedia. Palais Royal, people like Fourier formulated the utopias. Athene, Café in Paris, Impressionism. Café Montparnasse, the generation of the 20s and 30s. And so you go, so you go. It sounds strange, something so mundane like Café is such a powerful place where for good or bad, modern culture to great extent has been formed. But what I'm interested in also is one step further, that this institution has its specificity. It is manifested in a particular way in Paris, so it's a French cafe in Italy, it's an Italian cafe. So you know, English, maybe, uh, but each of them is specific. And what is actually puzzling about that and provocative is that if you go to France, you can find French cafe in Bordeaux, you know, see, you can go on and on. You cross to Italy, they still call it French cafe, but it's a joke. And uh, what makes it French? What makes it Italian? Italian. Very interesting. French. Right. The essential reality of the situation is, an inter is not entirely revealed in its visible appearance. It cannot be observed or studied just on that level. People tried, but they didn't get very common. Its representation of ontological structure can be grasped through a pre-understanding based on our familiarity with the situation and with its segment of the world to which it belongs. Pre-understanding in this case, is a sedimented experience of the world acquired through our involvement in the event of everyday life. The identity, for instance, of the French cafe is to a great extent defined by its institutional nature, rooted in the habits, customs, and ritual aspects of the French life. The formation of identity is a result of a long process, no doubt, in which the invisible aspects of culture and the way of life are embodied in the visible fabric of the place in a similar way as his language embodied in the written text. The visible text of the Carfax institution reveals certain common deep characteristics such as its location, relation to the life of the street, transparency of enclosure, certain degree of theatricality expressed in the need to see the life of the outside world, but also a need to be seen in it by an actor. The ambiguity of inside and outside expressed not only in the transparency of enclosure, but also in the choice of furniture, etc., etc. These are only some, of course, of the characteristics which contribute to the identity and meaning 
or the political institutions or situation. As a cultural and culturally distinct typical situation, the most important characteristic of typical situation is the ability to reveal the deeper strata of our experience and their relative stability. Memo Ponti uses the term constancy of experience, but we can also extend it now into constancy of situation. That's what is so strange. Our breakfast, our dinners, our major events in life, they repeat, repeat patterns. And it's just a kind of boredom. Why we do it all the time in the same way? Um, so the situation can be seen as places, rather, where world comes to visibility as an articulated continuum and structured totality of references, and as a communicative space of culture. It is there, in the intersection of communication, that it suddenly comes to identity. There is an understandable temptation to see the global experience of situation in terms of global styles, as character, as affection, or in Heideggerian terms, as a mood. The mood is the kind of most primary experience in grasp. Well, there's a temptation, but one has to be careful. In moods, the situation in which we are presents itself not as something that has to be solely, or has to do solely with our corporeality, but rather as something that has to do with our environment and with the world at large. It may be useful to remember that the term mood itself, particularly as it is understood in English language, is derived from German words. Stimmung. Most people don't seem to take notice of it, but it's very critical that um, one of the closest uh, young gener younger generation, a friend of Heidegger, a very, very accomplished uh, literary historian, Leo Spitzer, wrote an incredibly important book, influenced by Heidegger, no doubt about it in his book called Classical and Christian Ideas of World Harmony. Subtitle, Prolegomena to an Interpretation of the Word Stimmung. Lao Spitzer has this to say, quote from him, from his book, if we are to delve now into the historic foundations of Stimmung, we find the surprising fact that the German word, however individual may be, is used today, and however wide the mountain range is simply indebted to the all-embracing ancient and Christian tradition of harmony. The harmony can be seen in a different ways. If you take Stimon for a surface, sorry, as a mood in its surface appearance, you may have, with one of the expressionists, artists, in this case, know that that's the part. If you look slightly under the surface, you should, and I will emphasize it, you should discover more of that. Capitalist, harmonic development, harmonia mundi, and so on. Um, it is certainly possible to open the global experience of situations on the level of stimul or mood, but this will help us only to understand the background for the articulation of the world, only the background, and not the articulation itself, which we want to understand in the end. The role of Stimon in this understanding can be compared with the darkness of the cinema needed to make the image on the screen visible. So the mood helps you as much as the switching of the light in a cinema. But it doesn't help you to understand the image on the screen, which is our main interest. The screen is, in our case, Ongoing articulation of our world. The world is articulated all the time as we communicate and live. This takes place already on the non-verbal level through gestures and significant movements, embodied in rituals, in drama, in dance, but also in corresponding configuration of space in terms of its spatiality of space. All that leads to the discovery of similarities, metaphorical and analogical relationships, and finally, to the formation of the communicative space of the world and culture as a whole. The communicative space is formed by movement, which can be, for the reason described as communicative. 
The privileged place of movement is understanding the nature of the creative reality. This was already recognized by Aristotle. And in modern times, um, by Leibniz. In the 17th century, the movement was around. You know, people understood, talk about it, and so on. But it received a divine nature in the 17th century. The primary ultimate reference to the highest divine and so on would be formulated in terms of symbolic language. In the Middle Ages, in reference to light. In 17th century, on the top comes movement, takes place of light and symbolic uh, interpretations of the previous movements. It's interesting that Leibniz, he was an incredibly interesting type of man, was a singer of very enlightened man, you can say, fine, but he was on the boundary. He still understood the whole length and depth of tradition. And he held it very firmly and strongly to his contemporary against Descartes, claiming, like this, claiming that the notion and sorry, that motion, movement, and not extension, the res extensa, defines the physical bodies and the reality of the created realm. So it's not res extensa, but movement, movement, mobility. The ability of communication, a communicative movement, this is Manet, portrait of Zola, very good example of communication, letters of language. The ability of communication or communicative movement to establish the relations between the different levels and distant parts of reality can be best illustrated by the situation in which a text is dictated to another person who writes it down and reads it back to us. This is an illustration very concrete from inside, deep inside, the nature of the communicative movement in culture, how we bring the world together, moving through different areas and different levels of world, from its conceptual down to its imaginative, down to its sensitive, corporeal, and silent body on the ground. Example of dictation, of ledger, note, then into you know, the visual experience in front, going into sound, being typed, which means translated into kinetic movement of the fingers, appearing on the screen as visual experience again, read back as a sound, and the person who is, listens to the sound can compare it with what is written here. So we're going from vision to sound to movement, kinetic movement, and again, in the back, the message doesn't change. Different media. It's like listening to music, same melody, in different, different keys. The ability of communicative movement to establish relations between so many different levels and distant parts of reality can be illustrated probably best by the phenomenon of translation that I just mentioned now. Now we can recognize the physiognomy of the audible and visual patterns in such a way that the sequence of hearing, writing, and reading becomes a modulation of the audible, motoric, and visual space. Modulation, modulation, modulation. But something remains. Constant. And um, all of them sharing a common articulated movement without there being any need to spell the word or specify the movement in detail in order to translate, in order to translate one into the other. The translation, therefore, is more like a melody, as I said, played in different, things or different instruments. <clears throat> Just as all movements, Just as all movements, the communicative movement has its inevitable final reference. The translation goes up and down. You can see, you can imagine, you can feel, you can touch and be standing on the ground. That particular sequence has its ultimate reference. Not there, but there. As we can see in a second. Good. And in moving beings, we are dream drawn to something that is mo which is motionless, which is eternally the unshakable ground, the earth. This appears already in Husserl's 
uh, unpublished, or recently fragments which are published, unpublished manuscripts. And one of the sections, the manuscript section D, in it is a text of foundational investigations into the spatiality of nature, and subtitle the originary art, the earth does not move. It's interesting that already Hegel says, it is possible that earth moves in a physical sense, but in a metaphysical sense, it doesn't move at all. The earth, and I'm quoting now from the text of Husserl, the earth as a referent or bodily movement as such as that which is not in motion, which is firm. At the same time, we experience the earth as a power, as something that has no counterpart in our lived experience. It is a power as the earth that feeds us, something that penetrates us globally by our nature, by the structuring of our life. We are earth bound. The corporality of that we strive for in our life testifies to the power of the earth in us. That's last bit is The earth is the ultimate source of movement and is a reference as a ground. It is a reference to that earth motivates and defines the articulation of the world in a history of representations no better as cosmologies. In European history, cosmologies were only a framework and foundations for the history and for the theoretical thinking. It was in the communication between these three levels cosmology, history, and theoretical thinking, that the world of different epochs was articulated. I will say more about that, because I find that actually very important part of my argument to the end. It is difficult to resist the complexity, richness, and coherence of the world of some epochs, such as the classical world of Greece, the world of medieval cathedrals, the world of Renaissance humanism, and many others. It's not possible that some of them, some of the epochs behind us in history, some of them at least, could serve as a good illustration of the discovered life world of modern phenomenology. As everything suddenly came to our light, this was Sarah Heidegger, etc. Or are there other rediscovering the discovery? That's certainly the experience one has when you go through certain historical precedents. So well, that sounds like Husserl. Or even Heidegger. And if they are in the 15th century, 16th century, that's all and so on and so on. What is interesting is what's happening here, and I'm only, I just outlined it beforehand. Something which we normally not fully appreciate that there was cosmology right from early ages on Europe as it already written times etc. Now there is also room for history. Greece, fifth century BC already has history. But there is also theoretical thinking, classical philosophy, Parmenides and then later Aristotle and so on. So it's there, but what is important about it is that history is situated in cosmic conditions and natural conditions. Theoretical thinking in history and cosmic condition, so it's embodied in the primary natural conditions. What began to happen is that at certain point, 17th century roughly, the embodiment in the cosmic conditions is substituted by embodiment into history. And cosmic conditions are seen only from a historical point of view. And so it goes eventually to the next stage in our time when the theoretical thinking takes over history living in so-called post history as people very often say, don't know why. But we'll come back to it again. I'm using example just on the boundary. This is what you probably recognize, Aldorfer, and it's a painting illustrating the victory of Alexander over Darius, the battle at Isus. And there's no doubt that the history of the battle is seen more as cosmological things still. The cosmos is dominating the event. The sunset, the defeat, the end of the army of the Persians, and so on, is manifested through natural conditions or natural phenomena. 
So the history is quite really embedded in cosmology. But, as we will see very shortly, that would change. The most obvious um, Unfortunately, in such a question, the question about understanding, just what I said, the privacy of cosmology history and theoretical thinking, the embodiment in that sequence, is something which we had difficulty with. And phenomenology, particularly in the influence of Heidegger, has very seriously blocked our way to answer that question seriously. The most obvious for not asking such questions, or be forbidden to ask such a question, uh, was the assumption that our knowledge and understanding of history itself is superior to everything in the past, and that the continuity with the past was disrupted by the metaphysical nature of modern thinking. Gadamer is probably one of the kinds of systematically provides a revision. Says, probably not so clear, maybe not. He objects to Heidegger as a disagreement on that. He speaks, Garamer, about the relevance of Aristotle for contemporary hermeneutics. But we can say very easily, if so, what about the rest of the Greek culture? It was mostly the strong influence and authority of Heidegger that blocked more critical inquiry into our own field, and yet that could be heard already in his lifetime critical voices, from a number of such critical voices, criticizing mostly Heidegger generalization of the history of being as a forgetfulness of being. I'm choosing two closest to Heidegger's own position. One of them is Beramel himself, the second one is Ernesto Grassi, number one in our modern understanding of Renaissance humanism. Beramel says, behind the language of metaphysics of modern times is a language of the Indo-European people, which makes the metaphysical thinking capable of being formulated. But can a language or family of languages ever properly be called the language of metaphysical thinking just because metaphysics was sought a, um, and what would be more anticipated? like making Nietzsche blaming him for Nazism. Is not the language always the language of the homeland and the process of becoming, Adamus says, to be at home in the world? And does this fact not mean that language knows no restrictions and it never breaks down because it holds infinite possibilities of utterances in readiness? It's available. It seems to me, still Gadamer, that the hermeneutical dimension enters here a dimension, sorry, enters here and demonstrates its inner infinity in the speaking that takes place in the dialogue. Now, in the polemic with Heidegger understanding of humanism, because he's got another piece, the letter of humanism, very famous, which closes the door very much to what we understand as European humanism. And the aristocracy complements Gadamer's defense of the non-metaphysical nature of language, particularly on its poetic level, which is poetry. <coughs> now, Grassi see that there is misunderstanding in Heidegger, expressed very clearly in his famous piece, Heidegger's piece, Letter on Humanism, where Heidegger states, called Heidegger now, humanism does not ask about being's relationship to man and his essential nature. Humanism even hinders asking this question because, on the basis of its own origin in metaphysics, it neither recognizes nor understands the question. Heidegger understood humanism to be only a superficial rediscovery of man, and humanism in which, for example, the essence and function of poetry play no fundamental role. End of quote. End of, and end of Heidegger. In Grassi's view, Heidegger refers to tradition, quote, Grassina, which he did not himself know and which he misunderstood whenever he referred to it. 
in a better informed and critical understanding, Gracia argues, quote, the central problem of humanism is not man, but the question of the original context, the horizon of openness in which man and his world appear. And further, in the humanist tradition, there man always, sorry, there was always a central concern for the problem of the primacy of unhiddenness, openness, you know, that in which historical being, human being, does I, can first appear. For this reason, we need to reassess and revise the historical categories which still govern our thinking and don't be everything I did One revised category that we may already put forward from our territory, as it were, is continuity. Continuity between the contemporary philosophical understanding of the world, later stages of contemporary hermeneutics, right? and its historical antecedents in the past. The articulation of worlds, in plural, in which architecture always played a decisive role, were until the end of the 17th century dominated by cosmological thinking. Agreed. This meant, in reality, that history and theoretical thinking were articulated always in the framework of a particular cosmology. Business of proportions, harmonies, you name it, the whole body of principles of architecture, always in the cosmological framework of thinking. And that all the main principles, therefore, such as Ortine or as we say, proportions, harmonies, etc., are derived from the cosmic conditions as the ultimate level of the embodiment. The transformation of traditional cosmology into astronomy in the 17th century implied emptiness and deprived the traditional architectural principles, proportions, harmonies, etc., of their original meaning and led to a shift towards a new frame of reference which can be described as historical. This is something which has to be emphasized very strongly. People talk mindlessly about modern cosmology. There is no such a thing. We don't have it. We don't have it. The nearest would be natural philosophy, the philosophy of nature. And you know the difficulty people already have is it like Hegel and Shelley in the 19th century. So what we do have is the cosmology. It is astronomy, astrophysics, celestial mechanics. That's Truth of the matter. But they are fundamentally different from cosmologies and cosmologies. Astronomy is there for fundamentally different. If you like visual diagram, cosmology is a circle, astronomy is just a semicircle, the upper part. And when people say cosmology, then don't look to the ground, they look to the heaven. Why? It's more cosmology in trees, isn't it? Transformation is more to see. Anyway, new frame of reference. And that, of course, creates a vacuum. So what poor architects should do? Instinctively, step after step, visibly and visibly, they replace the principles based on cosmic conditions with principles based on historical conditions. Historical precedence, first time comes on the scene, the question of origin, which is important, which hasn't been important before, and so on. And we hear about things like uh, Solomonic temples and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, I think I have it here. Yeah. I'll show it to you later. <laughs> I, I have the Solomonic temple business. We come back to it again. Pachamism again. Now, the growing relativism of the historical thinking led at the time of the 19th century to a search for new objectivity, replacing historical by theoretical thinking, so that's the final stage in which we are today. What happened uh, in, the, yeah, in the move from cosmology to history has moved eventually again in the 19th century from history to theoretical thinking. And um, the reference to the history of cosmic conditions from a theoretical point of view can be illustrated by many modern Examples. Now, what is happening now is that the embodiment, the foundation of what is about, which means history is situated in cosmos, and theoretical thinking is situated in history, and history in cosmos. Now, is the movement towards the next stage. We start looking at it back. So we are on the historical stage. From historical point of view, 
looking at nature. And there is such a phenomenon that comes on the scene as a new phenomenon. History of nature. You say history of nature. So nature has a history. It does. But you have to reach that stage in the development of thinking. And so it goes. Eventually to theory. And I'm using the example, there's a kind of anticipation of what comes in my argument further. Um, what happens when we look at it from the next stage, from the point of view of theory? You're looking theoretically now at history and theoretically at the cosmic conditions. The most interesting example, I think, is belongs to what has been labeled recently as deconstructivist movement. The deconstructivist movement it's very close to a process that uh, can be seen as a process of crystallization. And uh, the crystallization is something which eventually dominates, particularly the 20th century, almost the time, all the primary movements. That you know. Now, a few just illustrations of that. Already the father of modern artistry, Alex Lee from Vienna, writes, all artistic creation is essentially nothing other than a competition with nature, and the fundamental law according to which nature forms dead matter is that of crystallization. Crystallization is seen by Rico, therefore, as a cosmic principle which brings together nature and art. But as a nature, seen from theoretical point of view, not from the point of view of nature itself. It's interesting that in the retrospective assessment of the early avant-garde, influenced very strongly by French Cubism, Ozanfan writes, Ozanfan was a colleague of Cartesian, as you know, he speaker for the new stage in the world and post-Cubism, Cubism and purism and so on, as we move on, etc. What he writes about Cubism is interesting. On the whole, one can detect a tendency which might be described metaphorically as a tendency towards the crystal. The crystal in nature is one of the phenomena that touch us most because it clearly exemplifies its movement towards geometric organization. Nature sometimes reveals to us how it forms or how its forms are built up by the interplay of internal and external forces. The crystal grows and stops growing in accordance with the theoretical, it's interesting, theoretical forms of geometry. And man takes delight in these forms because he finds in them what seems to be a confirmation for his abstract geometrical concept. So it appeals to our theoretical way of thinking, but it's nature, it's cosmology, nature condition but now see on the theoretical point of view. Interesting. Nature and human mind find common ground in the crystal as they do in the cell, and as they do whatever order is perceptible to the human senses, that it confirms those laws which human reason wants to provide in order to explain nature. No. What is very clear in these statements is a reference to the primary cosmic conditions of creativity, but in a very, very new manner. The nature conditions, cosmic conditions, are seen from a detached theoretical point of view and appear only as formal, without genuine corporeality and mediating the role of history. History has disappeared. You can go straight to the nature principle. The result is a reference to natural cosmic conditions. True. It's true but only in terms of their theoretical reality. They are, as it were, transformed, sublimated into theoretical concepts. So it's not nature as creative as species, as a concept in a theoretical level of thinking. <clears throat> the real presence and role of the natural conditions, as well as the role of history, remain latent, contributing as a result to the formation of the Latin world of our current culture. Now, that's exactly the critical illustration or interesting point to make. That we have historically moved to more, quote-unquote, advanced stage, seeing cosmic, natural condition, 
as historical, something we as humans make it, and eventually even more advanced, that we can make a theory of history and theoretical concept can substitute history. So again, stage of advancement. And yet, and yet, despite the fact that becomes a mainstream in the historical development, the cosmos is still here, the nature is still here, history is still here. There, underneath the surface. That why I'm using the term latent or latent. Well, it's there. For a better understanding of the latent presence of the life world in the contemporary culture, its possible equivalence, its possible equivalence in the past, we have to look more closely now at the first transformation of the cosmologically based to historically based thinking and finally to a theoretical one. So he goes through it again just to appreciate what has really happened and what is the nature of our position today. How it comes to terms with contemporary phenomenology and analytics and how as a result of all that, you will be able to look back in a much more critical way and see the continuity and anticipation of the life belt of the past with the life belt of the present. So, as we have already mentioned, architectural thinking was until 18th century formed in reference to natural conditions, most often replied simply as nature. I'm not going into it, it's just in brackets. Art, architecture, is imitation of nature. Anybody in the room can tell us what it means? I hope not. <coughs> the reference to natural conditions took place in the framework of cosmos, articulated as cosmology. These are art. Uh, cosmology. Um, as far as architecture is concerned, the order of proportional harmony were defined primarily already by Plato and his demise, modified later in the Neoplatonic and Aristotelian orientation of thinking and developed into a long tradition of Christian cosmology and in the new subtle and critical interpretation of Plato, Gadamer himself already demonstrates clearly the non-metaphysical nature of Plato philosophy, including his cosmology. Therefore, we can happily return to it and see continuities with our uh, time. We have no time, but you know, assume that you are trained as artists or art architects and so on. You know where architectural proportions come from and so on in reference to the Platonic cosmology, demands there in particular. <coughs> Christian cosmology was based on the conception of the world as finite, closed, and hierarchically ordered whole, in which the hierarchy of values determined the hierarchy and structure of being, rising from the dark, heavy, and still the So hierarchy of values determines the hierarchy and structure of being rising from the dark, heavy, and imperfect earth to the higher and higher perfection to the stars and heavenly spheres. The result was an articulated continuum dominated by communication between different regions and levels of the world, situated in the corporeality of the cosmic conditions. Now the development of cosmology during the 17th century concentrated on the universality of cosmic law and formation of new heliocentric system in a process that replaced cosmology, Copernic, Hus. Um, now the new astronomic system, still referred to today, rather wrongly as we said, a new, as a new cosmology, became an indefinite and even infinite universe which is bound together by the identity of the fundamental components and law, and which in English, all these components are placed on the same level of being. This is the term implies the discarding by scientific thought of all consideration based upon value concepts, such as harmony, perfection, meaning, and aim, and finally, the utter devaluation of being, the divorce of the world of value and the world of fact. As a consequence of the So 
17th century transformation, man was the world in which he was living and about which he was thinking and had to transform and replace it. Not only his fundamental concept and genius, but even the very framework of his thought. This is, by the way, invented by uh, the relation of Geo and Eric Century. You have Pico de Grave, astronomer and right? In a very serious discussion with another contemporary astronomer called Riccio, Academy of Sciences, Paris, second half 17th century. <coughs> So the frameworks change. The transformation can be described in more simple terms as the destruction of cosmos. The same forces that contributed to the destruction of cosmos created conditions for the rise and later the domination of history as a new framework of culture. The rise of history coincided with the changing nature of cosmology, which apart from the shift to astronomy, changed in a process that can be described as Temporalization. Suddenly, time. Time is a history. Time suddenly becomes very important in the way of thinking. Before they'll be talking very happily about static structure of the cosmos, structure of reality, structure of the world. Now, time cannot be ignored. It comes in. So, everything is practically temporalized, influenced by thinking in terms of time. And then, of course, the temporalization has gone also influence on cosmology. The traditional sense of cosmic order as relatively stable and permanent was undermined by the discovery of signs of change and temporal development, leading to the sense of progress and to the anticipation of evolution. The old libraries and the new libraries would like that. <coughs> the main sign of change were found in the domain of paleontology in the enigmatic nature of fossils. Certain people begin to discover things that are there and there are many things which are, you know, stone fossils and so on. They must have been part of some kind of a process. The biblical creation of the world in Genesis itself acquired a date, debated among others by such well-known scientists as Hooke, Boyle, and Newton himself. The English text, very amusing to read, by a man called Archer, dates the origin of the world, the creation of the world, to 4,012, 25th of October. <laughs> In the process of temporalization, all the main aspects of cosmos were substituted by historical equivalents. The paradigmatic vertical hierarchy structure was substituted by horizontal historical process in which the disintegration of cosmos led to the disembodiment of the world. This transformation represented a threshold of a new point in which the harmony of the traditional world revealed gradually in a dialectical process of thinking became a field of historic and aesthetic experience and judgment based on the continuation of taste and the role of the genius. Fair enough. Traditional representation based on the reference to the cosmic order was now replaced by representation referring to historical origin primitive heart, Solomon temple, and so on, and so on. The reasons for correct section are very amusing, and there are too many to show. I'm just showing selectively. That what people think it may have been. Some people took it very seriously, particularly somebody called Bill Alpando, a huge monumental reconstruction, fictitious, of course. Fictitious, but historically, quote unquote, true and untrue eventually turned into influence on people like Fischer von Bella, and see where the construction of the world on the, on the top of the mount. And that would be eventually built in many places, most explicitly and generously, in Escorial, outside Madrid. That's the result of the reconstruction. So that's a building based entirely on historical precedent, not on structure that comes out of the cosmic conditions entirely. Now, the, to illustrate the nature of the change, we may refer to people like Paul Perrault as one of the first to acknowledge the relativity of architectural order, its temporal nature, and the new phenomena such as conventional beauty taste. Blah, blah. However, we may refer also to a work of Fischer von Erlach, the Viennese architect, 
as a much more explicit example. In his uh, treatise on architecture, he doesn't use any of the principles that you find in the traditional architecture treatises, orders, columns, proportions, etc., etc. What you find is a sequence of historical precedents, starting from the uh, wonders of the world and going to ancient civilization to Rome, eventually to his own time, and he builds his own architecture on that particular line of Genesis. <coughs> what is interesting, he says, book called in German, the one outline of historical architecture, and work by an historian architect, the work published 1721, and it could be seen the first really explicit historical architecture we have. His treatise was, in fact, a personal interpretation based on historical and archaeological reconstructions and, to great extent, upon his own inventions, removing toward Piramesi and generation. Fisher describes his treatise in the following way, quote, this essay of diverse architecture will not only please the eye of the curious and those of good taste, but will embellish their minds. Artists will have seen that nations distant no less in their taste for architecture than in food. And comparing one with the other, they themselves may make judicious choice. So you're comparing the quality of buildings the same as you compare the quality of the food. End of quote. The terms now define the nature of architectural design are not only conventional beauty and taste on rule, but most of all character leading taste, or later leading itself, the character, as I mentioned, the modern concept of style. Fisher from Eva, inspiration is so much better. is <coughs> now Machia, then in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the gardens of the Aurea, narrow, here. and his own project for um, Schoenberg, the French version, very, very, Heroic. You can see the number here, right? The whole sequence going up, culminating in the palace of Chamber, which is bigger than Versailles, Vienna is at the point, central European Empire. And um, the sequence is a sequence of empire and civilizations, historical. Character, character. Um, second half of the 18th century. This becomes a dominating, dominating issue. People like the you know, French architect, German Bofrom, uh, writes, um, a man who does not know the different characters and who is unable to sense their presence in his buildings is not an architect. Further, architecture, although its object seems only to be used, the use of that which is material, is capable of different genres which serve to animate its basic solution by means of the different characters that it can express. The building can express, and he goes through the whole spectrum of possibilities, as you can imagine, through its composition or its composition as if on a stage, whether the sun is pastoral or comedy, whether it is a temple or past. And the same, as he says, is in poetry. He rolls out different genres and the start of one does not contradict the start of the other. So when you're dealing with problem by designing a prison, you're not referring to proportion, harmonies, and much. You express it in its character in a way like that. It speaks about the prison, nature of prison. The attempt to subsume the traditional poetics of architecture into the aesthetics of character created the illusion of order. But in the long run, proved to be the basis of relativism, arbitrariness, and confusion. Because if you come to that point of freedom and choice, it's not much common among principles. And therefore, the legitimacy of a unit is doubtful, and it makes people nervous, insecure. This was already evident in the younger architect, again, second half of the 18th century, French, Jean Francois Blondel, who wrote, quote, after all, it matters a little whether our monuments resemble formal architecture, ancient, Gothic, modern, provided that they have a satisfactory effect and a character suited to each genre of it is. We are very much already in a contemporary situation. The effect 
just to impress the you know, brand architecture, iconic architecture, landmarks, those are the terms used today, origins of the aesthetic. The aesthetic treatment of character may be vulnerable to the operations of taxonomy in which it became possible to isolate individual manifestations of character from the context of tradition and from the culturally established norms. The relativism and the end um, share arbitrariness of historical interpretation lead already at the beginning of the 19th century to a new search of a new kind of objectivity. There must be something common, not just sheer arbitrariness. And this is apparent mostly in the work of Diro, the disciple of Blair, who in his treatise Recay, a parallel, um, Architecture Ancien Modern, makes an assembly, and it's a very amusing operation. He selects all the buildings from the past, draws them in the same scale by his students, plan section elevation, that's where we have our documentation from, and then he distills from all these precedents, principles, that can be used as a universal set of principles for any kind of architecture you choose. So, elements should be combined in these terms with one another, how they are assembled each in relation to the whole, horizontally as well as vertically, and the second place, how, this is the second treatise where it shows you how to do it. All the principles, very elementary. Walls, staircases, pillars, columns, etc. And then you can make anything you want out of that. History is gone. The theory for thinking takes place of history. It has been absorbed in theory. The foundation of the new Sorry, he says it, you know, it's a matter of interest to Diron himself. Um, you can combine different parts of the building as porticos, atriums, vestibules, interiors, and exterior stair rooms of every kind, courts, grottos, fountains, etc. Now, once you have noted this part well, Diron says, you shall then see how they combine in turn in the composition of the entire building. In fact, finishes his text, which it is moving into the scale of city. You can design the whole city like that. End of quote. The foundation of the new architectural order was based on the assumption that history has run its course, that we are living in a post-history now. And we just stand still at the end of the 18th century. History, therefore, could be transformed into a new form of understanding, into a theory, which would be a recapitulation and consummation of the past, as well as the foundation of a new architectural order. The transformation of history into a theory represents the latest stage of architectural thinking, a stage in which the phenomenal understanding of wealth and origin. At this stage, natural conditions and history are seen. From a theoretical point of view, which means that their roots in the corporeality of the natural world and the continuity of reference to these roots are still visible, but only as latent. This is well illustrated in the following example. Sharoum designed, as you know, most remarkable concept, which means perhaps the very ambitious, if not the most ambitious, musical requirements, the interior, that's very beautiful. And yet, and yet, and yet, when he's on his drawing boards, and when it comes to say what he sees about it, how he came to it, his words are the following. He sees it as a direct, so it's not words, it's interruptions. It's a direct dialogue with nature, and it's seen in his terms as a landscape. His words now come, Shalom. The construction follows the pattern of a landscape, with the auditorium seen as valley, and there, at its bottom, is the orchestra, surrounded by a sprawling vineyard, climbing the sides of its neighboring hills. Very nice. The ceiling resembling a tent, encountering the landscape like a skyscape. End of book. This example brings us back to the initial question under what conditions can we recover the continuity between the phenomenology of the life world and its historical precedents? 
The first condition is to turn the silence of the local world into communication between theoretical, historical, and cosmological thinking. In other words, stop talking about history and cosmology, cosmic conditions, just from theoretical point of view. Don't stay where you are and be happy that everything is reflected in your theoretical consciousness, but go there. If you don't go there, you're talking about history in a very funny way, very distorted, or not at all. You're talking about cosmos in a simple, very problematic way. The first condition, therefore, is to turn the silence of the Latin world, the cosmic conditions of history particularly, into communication between theoretical, historical, and cosmological thinking and back. The second condition is to extend the horizon of our life world, current life world, phenomenology or phenomenology understood, into the horizon of latent traditions and discover the relevant continuities of design principles and then meaning there. This is a explicitly a hermeneutical task, task of a deep interpretation, known as the fusion of horizons in phenomenology. In the opening and fusion of horizons, we are likely to discover many surprising continuities, particularly with the world of Baroque, still articulated metaphorically and structured hierarchically as a plenum, as well as continuities with the long tradition of architectural thinking articulated in the framework of European humanism. So, as a conclusion, I would say this is a kind of critical attempt to establish a new type of introduction to the real tasks of contemporary phenomenologically based and oriented hermeneutics of architecture. Thank you. <coughs>
So he hoped that ladder to open the door, but to uh, humanism in a new key. Yeah. But that's hopefully what I was trying to say. And I think that the, I think also if you read the whole Grassi, you will get a lot of ammunition for your general project. Yeah, I know. And I think that. Uh, well, I, I know Grassi inside out because I've been going through his lectures. Yeah, I and think I was Grassi, in so I was just trying to put. When I was in Munich, I was primarily actually in business with Grassi. Yeah, and I wanted to put in a plug here because I think mm. he is a thinker we have still I agree. Totally, not totally enough agree. attention to. Totally agree. He actually published, as you obviously know, he has published the Plato piece during the Nazi period. That's right. And he had been, well, small comment, just for them. He was brilliant, really Italian thinker, and big, but you know, he was Italian. So during the Nazi period, the Italians were the friends of the Germans, but he was not. And yet, being Italian, um, he was uh, treated relatively very, very, very generously by the Germans. They led him to establish the Institute in Berlin of Italian Studies, and that exactly that the idea put into the idea in the print came about. And as a footnote, uh, what the person responsible, uh, the Nazis who did not want to allow the publication mm. of the Plato Lecture. Yeah. It was Mussolini who had good enough connections with Grassi, or Grassi with Mussolini, yeah. who prevailed on the Nazis to allow that publication. Yeah. So that's a, that's a weird history. No, it's a bizarre, bizarre, it's bizarre, bizarre right. But it was very clear, as you said, because I mean, his whole life was struggled not against Heidegger, but against many other people, you know, critical of humanism, uh, to, to rehabilitate humanism. His, you know, his, his department in Munich University was uh, Department of uh, Renaissance, it was called Renaissance Humanism Studies. And to oppose to philosophical thinking, yeah. a thinking where the imagination, which is what you're really pushing, where the imagination mm. would play an altogether different role than the traditional philosophical establishment had assigned it. That was his real, his real... As far as the book actually on that topic is titled that way, in German, <coughs> In translation, it would be the power of imagination and the incompetence of reason against power of imagination. That is, you know, reason has its own power, but let it Yeah. Thank you for an incredible, uh, incredibly wide range of allusions and references in the talk, most of which I couldn't address. But you made a passing comment about the relationship between deconstructivist architecture and crystallization, uh, as, I, as I understood, as it relates to the relationship between art or architecture and nature. Mm. And I was a bit concerned by that uh, comment because although there was an obvious uh, similarity in terms of sharp edges, let's say, between mm. the, the Leapscape project and the Crystal. Mm. The crystal is an emergent form, and, and, and they, they freely proliferate, but they're also very constrained in the geometries, whereas deconstructivist architecture seems to be completely unconstrained in its geometries and doing everything it can to be uh, unnatural, let's say. Uh, or did I misunderstand the point you were making? Um, you see, it may look different, but the principles, because it's mostly generated digitally, uh, has a kind of um, intrinsic geometrical structure. You have the geometries all the time. Even the aleatorics of people like Lin is basically geometrically based. The uh, digitally oriented design cannot operate without certain kind of geometrical infrastructure, call it whatever you like. So if the crystal is that or that shape, that's not the point. The point is about crystallization. And uh, you know, looking at certain people like Zaha, looking at Libeskin and Libeskin in particular, he actually his autobiography uh, reflected on that, and, and he says, spends a whole page almost on um, that he believes that in fact the principles of Canterbury architecture is in crystal and the process of crystallization. You know, we have no time to go through that. I you know just touched it literally, but. Uh, 
it's quite amazing. The more you look at it closely, the more surprise, surprise, surprise everywhere. And in the 20th century, you know, the cubist Corbusier described his, uh, you know, Maison, 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 the, 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 the Villagage, for instance. As a result, you'll be harmonically transparent, like crystal. Breton, I would like to live in a house which has a shape of a crystal, and it's transparent, and so on. You know, the, and uses this in Med Love in the, in the publication. Breton. So the crystal expression is yeah, left and right, everywhere you go, it's crystallization. But that's not the point, you know, the shape of it and so on. But as a vehicle, and even more as a way of thinking, as a process of crystallization. In other words, you know, again we don't have time to go into it fully, but what's happening nowadays in architectural schools particularly, the generative structures. And um, and um, yeah. I remember very vividly when I was student, books like uh, R.C. Thompson, The Art and the Nature, was a joke. They didn't compare anything more slowly and articulate in art with the shape of a shell um, or, uh, on the surface, but it's a sort of formalization to the limit. All the students now, places like Architecture Association, they walk with their, on their arms with the Bible of creativity. Now, all the principles of generic architecture goes back to the principles, as they believe, of primordial creativity, which you can find in the natural phenomena and processes. Now, that's exactly what I was trying to assess. Interpretation, the hermeneutic of that process, has to open the spectrum, unfortunately, because otherwise it's incomprehensible. Because it's something which is layered. That's exactly why I went through the stages, because there's no way to disclose it. But to see the layers, that what you're dealing with is a reference to some primordial conditions. But without mediation, you see it straight as a theoretical problem. You don't see that there is a history. In other words, in any natural processes, as we would normally understand, we have to take into consideration the history of the process. You know, there are shells somewhere in the back behind, but they don't help us to understand what I mean, do they? The history cannot be ignored. And of course, it is through that sequence that you eventually come to something primordial, more given natural conditions, cosmic conditions, there. and the cosmology of the 17th century that Boromir was living in. Fair enough. But you know what is different in our situation is that the layers have been substituted and ignored, as it were. and yet they are there. That's exactly one of my main points. The latent reality is still present in full. There is so much sound today as it ever was in the past. There are so many parameter processes going on through the nature of metabolism as ever in history. And yet, the natural processes to us are just a question of you know, benefiting from it, from our theoretical models. What you know, can, can you make out of it? How can you see it you know, as a kind of uh, theoretical productive model or productive uh, proposal? So, um, that's where the crystallization becomes deeper phenomenon. It's a process, a way of thinking, and then of course it comes to the manifestation, which sometimes is more rectangular, so to speak. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. You know, Gary is as crystallization as is probably in the So that's what I would feel. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Delagora. I, I enjoyed the analysis of the whole lecture very much. I just wondered whether you could expand a little bit on uh, the last point that you, you made, where you, you say we need to go there. And I'm just wondering ah. how we go there to a place that is so unfamiliar. Um, how, do you, how do you envisage this? Hey, well, I envisage it, I'm sorry, I see it just as a uh, uh, moment of truth, as it were. Uh, you know, we're talking about history and what has happened in the past at the stages, and we still see this horizontal line. And in fact, history and past is not there. It's the depths of the present. It's underneath our feet. It's here. Our language is several thousand years old. Most of the languages. We're still using it. And our experiences, you see, what is interesting is we 
particularly in architecture, we are in a, two clubs to the dimension of the modern cities, modern situations, which is completely sort of sucked into relatively one dimension of success, which is to do with originality and progress. So that's what comes from technology. Technology, by its very nature, is that kind of phenomenon. Because architecture is so close to it, we're getting blind by the light of technology. And we believe that simply everything that matters has to be of that kind. And therefore, we don't see you know, the ingredients, the dimensions, the full nature of situations that we interpret in our design. How people walk, how they sit, how they drink, how they, you know, how they live. And why is it that we as architects have such difficulty with anything which is just about 50 years old? You know, I have to be very careful when I do my students say, look at the sort of 1922 piece by somebody, it doesn't matter. We know when it's brought back, are you? What for? It's history, gone. Well, why do we perform all the music and listen to it? Why do we play Shakespeare and uh, Racine? Why do we bother about this whole thing? Why do we perform Greek tragedies still with incredible success and a credible message and communication to our problem today? King Lear is considered to be you know, still one of the most up-to-date things, as relevant as Beckett and so on. Why do we as architects have such difficulties saying something similar? No? That's a question mark, isn't it? So how do we get there? Well, that's the beginning, what I'm just saying now. How to get there is to get rid of the prejudices. We're not talking about limitations. The trouble is, you see, that because we are, we are reached upon this are so struggling to bring this whole sequence together, otherwise it's incomprehensible and impossible to argue. That when we talk about history, we talk about history not as history, but we talk about it as serial history, which means historicism. We talk about anything in the past from that sort of very detached point of view. And therefore, going back looks terribly sort of unnatural, stupid, silly, outdated, etc., etc., etc. What you have to do is go to the level which is underneath here. We live in living history. And suddenly, if you look at it closely, you discover the continuities are there, staggering, staggering continuities. You know, in the art of war, People still benefit from reading and understanding old closets, people like that. People study old weapons and understand modern weapons. People study old food and discover there is some wisdom in what we do or not doing well. You can go on and on and on. You know, is medieval music or Renaissance music just spend the prayer? Is it sort of to be thrown out of the window? No, we listen to it. But we understand contemporary musicians, intelligent contemporary composers. This is a good stuff. Now, the critical issue here is go to the level, not going there, but going to the level on which we suddenly recognize the resonance of continuities. That's what is anybody who understands something properly about hermeneutics. Understand there has to be that point of resonance. When you, you know, when you feel there's a resonance, reverberation, is something which goes into broader context of time, then it's sufficiently authentic, sufficiently relevant. And if it's 100 years old or 200 years old, we don't find Plato silly and irrelevant because it's too old. Do we? We don't. And you know, the most interesting contemporary, just one argument, the most contemporary interesting uh, studies in ethics and politics still read this great Prophet, old Aristotle, uh, his ethics and his politics. So, you know, people like Aristotle, McIntyre, and so on. The most interesting kind of contribution to the art of understanding the principle of politics, ethics in particular, ethos, Aristotle still says something more than even the most interesting people today. It's embarrassing, it's strange, but it's true. And uh, as Gadam Meron says, somebody came to him and said, Can I borrow? Uh, you know, the recent book by Brock. He says, I don't keep those modern books. As you can see, my library is all average about 2,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I presume, though, that we would go there critically. We wouldn't go there simply accepting. I don't know why. That's what I mean by the moment of resonance, you see. If, it's, if, it, if there is a resonance, 
means there is a critical already assessment implied in it. You know, there is a moment of judgment, there is a moment. You can use different words, you can say there is a moment of understanding. I know that certain spatial solutions in Baroque architecture are still incredibly, incredibly useful to look at very carefully. <coughs> because what Frank Gehry is doing in the interior of Bilbao, etc., is by comparison with Baroque pretty, pretty primitive and banal. Baroque was much more clever in many ways, especially establishing the simultaneity of setting, light, texture, material, and the overall power of a spatial configuration. That's true. You know, if you put it to students, I occasionally do it, and I don't tell them what it is, and I usually do a segment, a fragment, and show it to you. It is fantastic. Where is it from? You say, well, a guy doing that in Mexico. Already, I don't have to know more about it. You say, no, no, I'm sorry. It's Baltazar uh, Mariman. Oh, really? You mean the old guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we still have to be slightly more relaxed about it. And see. As I said, you know, what, what we do with music and literature and painting, you know, people still go to look at uh, the directors and a great, great part, isn't it? And so on. So, uh, you know, it would be terribly, terribly, terribly sort of, uh, you know, like Taliban vision of culture. You know, you're not supposed to sing. You're not supposed to look at it. It's too old. It's very bizarre, you know, we don't come to go to that. It's very bizarre how our liberalism became authoritarian. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be modern, you're supposed to be up to date. You're supposed to be you know, very at home with genders and stuff like that. If not, you're in trouble. You're not supposed to look at old pieces. You're not supposed to, you know, just in air all the time, isn't it? When Gropius came to Harvard, beginning of the war, he closed the library. Students were not allowed to go to the library. And he gradually removed all the historical books. Some of them he kept in his office. <laughs> so, you know, this is a kind of, um, um, I don't know, almost into cultural inquisition, cultural certainly uh, censorship, which is partly visible, partly invisible, but it's in air. You know, history is tough. You know, I was teaching for 10 years at AA, and you know, the people like Peter Cook and Artie you know, anything that was just slightly referenced beyond 20 years back. Oh, that's historicism. And yet, not being fully aware of it, they've been doing it themselves. Doing it all the things. Chernikov was Bible. You know, all this constructivist uh, vision, visionary set of drawings. Mm -hmm. When I came to A, it was original edition. The only person who ever borrowed it was Peter Cook. So he was at home and studied it very carefully. This is about 60, 70 years old. So what do you do? Where is history? Where is the line? What is it anyway? Does it matter? And it's too old. Okay. So we, we have difficulties here. The continuities. And uh, because of that, we not really, uh, we, we find it difficult to come to the point where the mediation would become available to us in form of resonance. Suddenly resonance. How old it is, I don't care. Look, the skills of gardens are pretty old, aren't they? It's to resonate still. Why do we spend time talking about this heat and saying, oh, fantastic? Better to sit at home and have a cognac, cocktail, cold. Anyhow, so I think the moment of a little bit of effort, but also knowing what you're looking for, what you're looking at. And I think that's where I myself would play modern hermeneutics, open the door very, very wonderfully dramatically. And extend it to the territory of study. You know, phenomenology, shall we say, broadly speaking, as an issue of 20th century, into issues that goes back several hundred years easily. There's quite a bit of phenomenology in Florence, and there's a great deal of phenomenology probably even in the classical, certainly later. The interpretations are so fantastic, imaginative. 
and not boring, full of ironies. And so, so that's really what I was trying to say, two things. You know, if I can summarize the point of my argument at two sides, two sides of the point. On one side, there's the question of corporeality. That's what it is. Proper understanding. Not comparability as fragments. That's why Memophon is slightly disappointing because it takes you a long way. There's a fragment here, fragment there, fragment there. To make it really part of integral understanding of value. And that happens you know, in some pieces. Uh, Patochka is a very, 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 very wonderful example of that. Fine. But the body, the corporeality, has something to do also with the history of our culture. We lost the corporeality in the sense of it because we lost or we replaced the primary, spontaneous, normal reference to the natural conditions by history and then eventually by theory. And we're living in the theoretical world, which is bodiless. People who are dealing with digital world and understand what they're talking about systematically, they know that one of the main, unfortunately, unfortunately, conditions, problems, and limits of artificial intelligence is that that artificial intelligence does not have a body, does not imitate corporeality. Its mind of certain kind that is imitated in the digital processes. So the corporeality, so you know, two sides are fine. The body is a problem as such, but it has been created historically that we in fact live our bodies in a very theoretical, highly artificial manipulated level of problem. Maybe just one more question before we go to lunch break. <coughs> I, I need know the microphone. Thank you very much for a, a nice lecture. Uh, I wonder if you could ask the question whether what we find deep down there in history is knowledge about relations or knowledge about instances. I remember that Heidegger in Simon Sight says that logos in, in its it, uh, essence means relation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it I mean, like think of crystal, yes. crystal as the nature's, uh, nature's way of relating. Yeah. Uh, and that, for me, makes a difference whether it's a question of we deep down there find essences or we find knowledge about relations. Uh, Before you find essences, you must find relations because otherwise the essences are not essences of anything. The essences are the only essences of relations. Relations are preconditions for anything to be essential. Uh, because, you know, unless there is something, whatever it is, you can say, you know, is it essential or not essential? Or the essential of something, preconditions, or it's preconditioned by establishing something. But something comes into focus out of the articulated continuum in which you concentrate on a particular part of the continuum, in which something identifiable, which is identity profile, comes to light. And then you can start saying something about it what is essential to us, the combination of colors and whatever. But it's always a network of relationships, always. That is why you can go.